Today I've got a how to play video of Freedom. Uh, this is a game that's going to be kickstarted soon. Uh, I expect by the end of March. Designed by Vangelis Bagiarticus, a Greek designer, and it's going to be published by Phalanx Games. This game plays a little bit similar to Twilight Struggle, but in about half the time, and is a bit less complex than Twilight Struggle. It adds a layer of tactical battle in the form of a siege between two asymmetric opponents. There's an Imperial player who is more powerful and has an expensive mercenary army to attack with and there's an insurgent player who is besieged in the city of Messalonghi, I think that's how you pronounce it, um, who are more determined and desperate as they fight. So this is the board layout of the city of Missolonghi. You can see that uh, down here, this is the city area. And the insurgents start off the game uh, occupying the wall. Uh, the insurgents are the blue cubes and uh, the imperial players are the red cubes up here. You'll also notice that there are some black cubes on the walls and in the, and in the imperial army. These are the cannons that they've both fielded. Um, this game comes with asymmetric uh, player powers and asymmetric victory conditions. We're looking at the imperial side of the board. Um, up here we've got a morale track. The imperial player starts on 15 and if this track ever drops down to zero, all the way down to zero, then the imperial player loses the game. Likewise with the insurgent player, if they ever drop down in morale down to zero, they will lose the game as well and the insurgent player starts on 10. The game will also be over um, if the Imperial units get any uh, into the city. Um, obviously that will be a win for the Imperial player, for the red units. And the insurgents will win if the game gets to the end of the sixth round. There are only six rounds in this game. And it plays a bit like a card driven war game, a CDG, that uh, is so familiar in the coin series and Labyrinth and Empire of the Sun and all of those. So I'll just show you some of the cards. So this is the Imperial player's hands. And you can see that there's a familiar action point in the top left corner with an event that's described in the text underneath. And Imperial events are the red flags and the insurgent events are the blue flags and neutral events. In this, the player can choose to either play an event of their own colour or completely ignore an event of the opposing team and just use it for action points, which is a little bit different and um, makes the game a little bit less uh, complex than something like Twilight Struggle, where you're just trying to work out how to mitigate the bad cards in your hand. In this area, we've got the the city of Messalonghi and there's a wall. This is probably the most important part of the board, is this wall where the insurgents are defending against the Imperials. You'll see underneath these areas there are four forts on the wall and the forts provide def defensive bonuses beyond that of what the standard wall consists of. There are rows beyond the wall. This is the first row beyond the second, third, fourth and we have this special area up here called the camp which is where the Imperial Reserves will sit. And then up on the top half of the board we've got the supporting areas and we've already seen the morale track but there's also a preparation track for the Imperial player, a plea to the government and then there are supporting areas. Likewise the insurgent player has got a preparation track and the preparation tracks plays exactly like they do in Twilight Struggle where a player who cannot think of a sensible move to do with leftover action points from the card play can store um, an extra one, two 
in the case of the Insurgent play it only goes up to two for use in a later turn in that round. There's also a plea for government uh, up here on the Insurgent side and finally the major difference on the Insurgent side of the board is that they've got this population track where at the end of each round you'll be counting the number of civilians and units in your force that are besieged and you'll have to pay some pay uh, supplies. So we start the game with 20 units on the board and we need to pay four supplies to feed that force. In the middle of the, um, the supporting areas track we've got the most significant areas and at the end of each round the level of support on these areas will indicate the rewards that each player gets. Now you can see that somewhere at the moment Anatolikon, and I apologise for butchering these Greek names, is in the control of the insurgents with two support markers. But at the end of the round they will get one morale for holding that. Likewise Guria is in the control of the Imperial units and they will get one supply at the end of the round. There are other bonuses and probably the most significant here is in Patra where the Imperial player will get three supplies and one black cube which is a cannon piece which they will be able to put into their camp at the end of the round. The way in which the plea tracks work is different for each player. In the Imperial plea track um, has to roll less than a certain number on two, uh, 2d6 but each time he makes a plea to the government this plea track will go up by two. Um, if it's less than 12 the total dice roll on 2d6 added to the plea track number if it's less than 12 he'll get three money for the end of the round to pay his mercenaries. Next time it will be four added to 2d6 so it will get progressively harder for the Imperial player to get funds out of the government. The insurgent plea track works slightly differently. In this, in this occasion they've got to get more than 12 on 2d6 plus the uh, plea track number. So as they spend action points to advance their plea track it will add to the roll of 2d6 so eventually the chances are fairly high that the plea will be successful and the insurgents when they have a successful plea will get six supplies, um, two units and two morale so it's a, a massive boost to the insurgents but unlike the Imperials who can do it time and time again until it becomes impossible um, for them to gain any support from the government the insurgents are able to only do it one time in the entire game. This is a prototype and some of these things may change. I don't know what the designers or the publisher has got in mind for the Kickstarter but I just want to run you through a few of the units that we're looking at. I've already mentioned the blue insurgent units and the red imperial units um, but we've also got white civilians in the city. These will need to be fed by the insurgents every time. We've got this black cubes here on the forts, these are the cannons. We've got a special purple bombard which gives a plus one die roll modifier when the insurgents are attacking. No siege is going to be complete without destroying the wall and there are tokens in the game to indicate a damaged wall and then once it's flipped it will go to a destroyed wall and these uh, damaged and destroyed just provide bonuses in the um, cannon phase. We've also got money. Now money is only really important for the Imperial player. The Imperial player still has to feed his army but the insurgents are mostly concerned with the amount of supplies that they get each turn. So I said there are six rounds in the game. Each round has got five phases. The first of these phases is administration where you update the board to reflect what happened in the last round and then you move into the opening. The opening is just a simple move. Um, the Imperial player is able to advance five 
units um, from one row anywhere on the, anywhere up uh, to the next row. So I could move four, five units. Now I will say at this point that these spaces outside the wall have a limit of three units each and the spaces inside the wall or on the wall and in the city down here have a limit of two units in each space. Once the Imperial player has made his advance move, the Insurgent player is able to redeploy. And that just means that I can take a piece from anywhere on the board and move it to another area, um, just reacting to the Imperial player's advance. After the opening round has been completed, and that will take all of about 20 seconds for both players, you're into the actions. Now, as I said, each player has got a hand of eight cards and they will go through seven of them in each round. Um, the Imperial player or the player with the highest morale will go first and they will play one of their cards using all of the action points as they see fit. Once the Imperial player has finished one card, then the Insurgent player will take and they'll alternate back and forth until they've both played seven cards. Then we get into the cannon phase and the cannon fire separately from attacks. So attacks can happen during um, action point spends on the cards or through an event on the card, but the cannons will not be part of any of those attacks. They fire after all the cards have been played. They can target any row um, up to three spaces away and the to hit number is going up from four to five to six on the third row away so if a imperial you imperial unit was there and I wanted to fire with this cannon I would need to roll a four on 2d6 if I was aiming at him there then I would need to roll a five. And if I've rolled two fives, for example, that would be two hits, I could simply remove um, both cubes, both units, and they would go off the board. Once the Imperial cannons have fired, then the Insurgent cannons will fire, and the Bombard will fire, which has got one longer range, so they can actually target units in the fourth row and it's a plus one, so they can go four, uh, sorry, three, four, five, six are there to hit numbers um, out to the fourth row. The, um, the insurgents can never target anything in the camp. But once the cannons have both fired, then there'll be replenishment action. In the replenishment action, the players get to take the supplies for the areas that they control, and then they will pay their armies. The Imperial player, four supplies and eight gold each turn to feed and pay their army. If they can't pay, they'll lose a unit and they'll lose two morale. And remember, if you lose enough morale down to zero, then you've lost the game. They'll need to pay four gold in the first period which is the first three rounds in the second period they'll need to pay six gold likewise in the first period they'll need to feed their units six supplies um, and if they can't feed they'll lose one unit and one morale and depending on where they are on this morale track they may lose there'll be maybe further penalties to lose more units the insurgents don't care about paying their uh, units or the civilians um, but what they must do is feed them and if they can't feed them based on the requirement here at the moment I'm sitting on I need four food to, to feed them I'll lose one morale I don't lose a unit as the insurgent player as they're all already starving and losing units is actually helpful because it may take my food requirement down so you don't lose units as the insurgents but you just must feed them and if you can't feed them, you'll lose morale. Finally, the last action of the replenishment phase is the insurgent uh, check for whether their plea has been successful or not. 
2d6 added to the number on the plea track at the moment it's sitting on seven so I would need to get uh, a roll of five or more to, to equal or beat 12 and if I am successful then I'll get that bonus of morale units and supplies and then you're back into the administration which is the last phase of each round round where you advance the turn marker to the next round draw seven cards remember you've got one card left in your hand from the previous round so you'll start each round with eight cards and keep going until you get to the end of the third round where you'll discard your all the cards from your hand and you'll start drawing from the second deck and then you do that six times until the end of the game where a player has either lost all of their morale or the imperial units are inside the wall or the city area or it's the end of the sixth round and then the insurgents win. So I'll quickly describe the actions that you're able to do when you're spending the action points that are on the cards. And they are different for each player. So for example, if I was the insurgent player playing this card, I would have four action points to spend. Or I could do the event where this allows me to remove a cannon and up to two Imperial units from a space in the first two, row, two rows from the wall. The different actions that the Imperial player can make, they can spend one AP to move two units, uh, one space, or they can spend one AP to move one unit, two spaces towards the wall. And one AP to make a slow movement where onto a damaged section of the wall or in the blue areas around the lagoon. They can spend one action point to move their preparation track up by one, which will enable them to use more action points in the next round they can spend two action points in the support area and the support area is a nice little mini game it's a, a zero sum game so Zygos has started with four in, uh, insurgent support tokens on it if the imperial player spent two action points in the support area they could um, add one support so as the Imperial player, to add one support to this stack, I would simply remove an Insurgent one. And I could do that as many times as I'm willing to spend two action points removing one. If I ever get down to zero support, it will stay as the owning player until there's one more support action, and then it will flip to Imperial support. The Imperial player can spend three action points to... Um, plea for funds and every time they do that their plea marker will go up by two they'll roll 2d6 and if they're under 12 they'll be successful and get three money spend a number of action points to build a cannon if they wanted to build a cannon let's say for example in this row they would need to spend seven action points and they could put a cannon down where there's already an Imperial unit. Seven action points is a lot and no card has got more than four action points. So this is where the preparation track would come in handy. For the Imperial player, it goes all the way up to five. So that's how they could get to seven action points, building a cannon adjacent to the wall. If they wanted to build a cannon in the second row, it would cost them five action points and if they wanted to build a cannon in the third row it would cost them three action points. Yeah, they can't just take it out of the game reserve, it needs to come from the camp area. And then finally the Imperial player can spend one AP to conduct an attack. Attacks must be from adjacent spaces, I'll talk about attacks a bit later. The Insurgent has got a similar but different set of actions that they can do. One AP can be spent to regroup, which we saw in the, the opening phase where they can move one cube from any space in the southern city to any other space. They can spend one AP to move up on the preparation track. Unlike the Imperial player, 
the insurgent player has only got zero, one, or two that their preparation track can be on. They can spend two action points in the support area, and just like the imperial player, two action points will add one support to an area. And if I was the insurgent player adding one support here, I wouldn't add a flag, I would just flip that. And then at the end of the round, I would get that bonus. As the Imperial player attacks the wall and damages it or destroys it, four action points will repair the wall. If it's destroyed, four action points will revert the wall to damaged and another four action points on another turn will remove the marker completely. I can spend four action points to train civilians, so any white cubes in the southern city, I can change that into a blue cube and place them on the wall. The insurgent player can also spend three action points to plea for the government. The insurgent player can spend four action points on one supply token that they've got, so they will need a supply token with four action points in order to build a cannon. Now, they can build a cannon in any space that already contains one of their units. Um, and unlike the Imperial cannon, Insurgent cannon, i.e. those on the wall, they can never move. The Insurgent player can attack also for one action point. And the last action the Insurgent player can perform is to raid. Now, in order to raid, my Insurgent cube will sortie off the wall, go and have a raid where they're going to remove a cube and run back to the wall. The cost of that is one, two, three, four action points. So every row that they move out to raid costs an additional action point, and there cannot be any Imperial units that they pass through. If they meet an Imperial unit in a space, that's where they're gonna raid and that's where they're gonna remove the Imperial unit. The one action I've not really described yet is the attack. It costs both players one action point to attack and they must a target adjacent space. If it's the Imperial player, then they're gonna be attacking the walls before they can start removing units, but the insurgent player can remove the red cubes as soon as they start attacking. Let's say we're going to attack from this space onto this wall. There's no fort there, so there's no additional bonuses. The Imperial player rolls 2d8 and they hit on 8. So with two threes, there's no hit there. Nothing happens on that attack. However, if the Imperial player had spent four action points and they spent them all on attacking, they could attack again three more times but this cube cannot attack again in that round. The insurgents attack very similarly but they can attack multiple times per turn. Each cube can attack multiple times. When the insurgents attack they roll 1d8 and they hit on a 6. So if the insurgents were attacking this imperial cube They've just rolled a three, they couldn't do it. But you know what? I've just spent three action points on that. So this cube, unlike the Imperial units that attack, this cube can attack again and again and again. So I'm gonna roll two more times. Let's see if I get a six, two, three. Unfortunately, the Imperial unit survives. But on a successful attack and a cube is removed, anytime that happens, the removing player can choose to increase their own morale track or reduce the track of their opponent. And remember, remo reducing your opponent's morale track to zero wins the game for you. So that wraps up my how to play preview of Freedom. Um, I've played a couple of games of this now and I will be writing up my review at wargamersneedfulthings.co.uk I'll provide a link in the show notes below. First impressions are really good actually. I really like the asymmetric powers of the two combatants. I, I like the mini game up here where you're vying for support. You always seem to want to do something down here in the, in the tactical map and yet 
there's also pressing concerns up here. Overall, I really like the game. It gave me the same feeling as Twilight Struggle, although admittedly I am not familiar with the theme of this game, but the designer has written a, a diary on Board Game Geek, and again, I'll provide the link to that page um, where the inspiration for this game came from. And it's a fascinating read. Thank you very much for watching. And thanks to Phalanx Games for sending this preview copy.